Okay, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Jefferson Cowie, as an, uh, who is an associate professor of history at Cornell University, where his work in social and political history focuses on how class, inequality, and work shape American politics and culture. He is the author of Staying Alive, the 1970s and the Last Days of the Working Class, and Capital Moves, RCA's 70-Year Quest for Cheap Labor, as well as The Great Exception, which will be coming out later this year, this fall. So welcome to the Soapbox, Jefferson Cowie. Thanks, Eric. Happy to be here. So, Jeff, I thought maybe we could uh, start with, with sort of a broad question, which I think you've been addressing through pretty much all of your work. Um, but America, as you know, is somewhat distinct among Western democracies in the sense that we don't have a labor party. Um, and so what is it that is unique about our sort of civic or demographic makeup as a nation uh, that is responsible for the lack of sort of a working class cohesion or the existence of, say, a labor party? Well, you've cut straight to one of the great debates in, in my field that, that, that goes back 150 years. Um, and uh, probably the, the sharpest uh, formulation of that was from a German sociologist named Werner Sombart in 1905. He wrote an essay called Why Is There No Socialism in America? And, um, and <clears throat> there have been so many attempts to answer this question uh, that you know it, it, it still remains a, a hotbed of debate. But there is clearly a relationship broadly and vaguely thinking between uh, the general homogeneity of a population and social democratic outcomes. So obviously we have the, you know, Scandinavian countries have a richer um, uh, social democratic and labor tradition than, than say, you know, we do. Um, and so a lot of people point to uh, massive immigration into the United States, uh, which is a, a constant source of division. We just merely have to look at our news today to know that, uh, that immigration is a problem. Uh, the colonial legacy of slavery in this society is you know, uh, uh, creates a problem. And we, again, I, I refer you to the news of what's been going on uh, between the police and, and the African-American community you know, across the country right now. Um, and uh, a host of other, uh, of other things uh, that some people look at, uh, the success of American capitalism, the promise of upward mobility, um, the um, divisions between uh, 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 Skill and unskilled, and uh, finally, I think something interesting that is that the U.S. has uh, had um, because of because of the availability of land uh, a higher wage premium than than other countries. So, you know, in other words, it costs more to hire a worker. Workers get get a little bit more money because they have an option to to move. But it's very difficult to control for any of those because you can point to you know you can point to Australia or Canada or you know it, it's. It's a very, it's so complicated and so mm. elusive that we don't really ultimately have a concrete and satisfying answer to this. But we do know there's something sort of unique about the United States. And I, um, one more thing on this: um, t people tend to call this American exceptionalism, and 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 um, what they mean by that is that class relations developed in a different or exceptional way in the United States. I, I want to shy away from that term because what we do is we see a, a broad range of uh, uh, form, working class formations uh, throughout uh, the world, and the United States is probably you know a little bit of an outlier, but but they're all kind of different. So we need to be careful of sort of saying, oh, you know, why is the U.S. so so different? They're all they're all different, but we are on one edge of that difference, I think. Well, I'm interested in uh, you know the essay that you sent me, getting over the New Deal, which is, which is, you've expanded for uh, your book, The Great Exception. Um, you know, you you mentioned the relative homogeneity of of the population at the time of the New Deal, and and sort of uh, the the lack of a strong sort of immigration movement, and and maybe that helped contribute to the unique circumstances that allowed for uh, the New Deal to take place, and that that's an intriguing thought. I hadn't really ever thought of that. What does that say for the contemporary sort of <laughs> constitution of America, where we are so diverse and increasingly diverse? Right. Yeah. No. The, immigration scholars tend to, you know, really spend a lot of time thinking about when people are coming here and what that means to the United States. Immigration is shut off in 1924. 
And then people really don't really think about it that much for the period where there isn't immigration, and that because it's turned back on in 1965. Um, but we have this period where there isn't immigration in this country. And that does, I think, take away one of the more divisive political dimensions in American history. So this period in which, you know, we come as close as we have ever come to having sort of a northern European social democratic system, and it was not that, but we came closer, uh, really maps pretty neatly onto this period of, of relative social homogeneity. And, and that is an enormous problem for mm. us, because I, I wouldn't, I, one could read that as a argument to close down immigration. Um, I don't. There are some who do. Um, I think immigration has enriched this country tremendously in a variety of ways. But it, 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 it basically means we have to work. I, I used to make the argument, you know, we really need to cohere around questions of class. Now I'm more of the mindset, I actually think we need to work through these questions of diversity very, very thoroughly before we'll ever actually see a cohesive class identity. Hmm. What do you mean by that? How, what would that look like, working through those questions? Well, I think we're doing it every day. I mean, I think this is a, learn. you know, uh, I, I, I've, so we have, we have to, we, we as a society, as a polity, every day we're, we're, we're faced with these questions. Are we going to let these children cross the border from Guatemala and Mexico? Are we going to allow the police to brutalize African Americans? You know, wh how are we going to respond to these questions? And the, it, it's that every day working through this so that you can begin to, uh, begin to see the shared economic interests amongst working people um, but it, it's it's actually a long, long road to hoe. I think it's I think it's you know I used to see, be more naive and say, oh you know pretty soon we'll just all figure out we have these shared common interests and move forward. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm actually less sanguine about that now. I think we have more work to do than I I once might have thought. <laughs> well, that's a little bit uh, depressing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry. G given the enormity of of you know the. The, uh, the challenges that the country is facing as a result of sort of the capitalism run, run amok, and by that I mean specifically, you know, the threat of ecological catastrophe, right. um, a along with the, the gross inequities of our society, um, the, the timeline doesn't seem to be very long. And, and that the, the problems that you're saying we need to deal with before we can even get to a position of dealing with class seems to demand a long timeline. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it, yeah, we have sort of this ticking um, time bomb problem that's actually going off as we speak. I think, and mm -hmm. uh, and it, it is. It, it I I'm basically saying that if you if you look at the moment, and I actually think it was a moment. Actually, I think it was actually a very short moment between 1935 and 1938, in which most of the legislation that we depend upon. Uh, for uh, labor rights, and here I'm thinking of Social Security, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and the Wagner Act, which uh, allowed uh, legalized unions. If you look at that, it, it's a very tiny window, and then that window sort of closes, and it's really based not just on immigration, but also um, it only passes because of racial exclusion. Mm. We, we, the solid Democratic South only votes for all of that because... Uh, it excludes most of the occupations that are uh, uh, dominated by African American workers because the Solid South is not going to vote for it otherwise. Um, and so, as soon as politics become racialized again in a more explicit way, when civil rights begins and things like this after the war, it really, um, you know, we revert to a sort of norm around race and immigration and these things. And so, how do we move? You know, how do we? I, my, I have less of a set of solutions than I have a sharper definition of our problems, and I think it's it's kind of scary. I think is what you're getting at, mm. how how uh, intimidating and and overwhelming these problems can be, because you know those, those sort of miracle years were pretty 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 short, really, um, and but they cast a long shadow, you know, for decades. Mm. I think they really did. You know, inequality went down and wages went up, and things were pretty good, uh, at least for white male industrial workers. How do we, you know, what I'm saying is, 
Obama's not the next FDR, and the next economic downturn is not going to create a new New Deal. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I, I think, you know, there seems to be, correct me if I'm wrong, but there seems to be a new and growing consensus that sort of the New Deal order and the shared prosperity of that era was, um, was a, a temporary blip on the American historical timeline, rather than sort of the ideal that, that we will be returning to shortly. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to argue. Is that the, I'm, I'm sort of the literature and I think the popular political understanding has always been, oh gosh, you know, as soon as we get through the Reagan period, uh, we will return to our kind of liberal traditions. As soon as we, you know, get the Democratic Party back from the New Democrats, uh, we'll return to our liberal traditions. As soon as blah blah blah, and. It's not happening, you know, and everybody thought once we get Obama elected, this will happen, and obviously it has not happened. Um, and so, the, you know, the I, I joke that, uh, um, you know, a lot of liberals during the Reagan period were waiting for that to be over so they could return to uh, uh, the old Democratic tradition, but I, uh, the old Democratic tradition they returned to was Grover Cleveland's, not Franklin Roosevelt's. Um, and... So the, what I'm trying to do is sort of intellectually, politically, and culturally clear the decks. Mm-hmm. Let's, you know, I think that the New Deal has, is this enormous mountain of success that some way clouds our historical vision, and we need to look beyond that. There's, there's suppressed historical alternatives that we can begin to think about and experiment with and that are going to prove, I think, more useful than just waiting for the next you know, crisis, leader, industrial mobilization package. Hmm. Well, so help us clear the decks um, and, <laughs> and help us understand why the Great Depression led to such a revolutionary political realignment, whereas the Great Recession has really not. Yeah, well, you know, here's the thing. It, down, economic downturns do not typically... Uh, empower working people or the left. Hmm. Often it's the opposite. It was the opposite after World War One. It was the opposite in the 1890s, you know, when Debs is thrown in jail and the railway unions are broken. Um, so we should not expect there to be actually a relationship between economic downturn and social justice. And Because, again, the New Deal has created this linkage in our mind. Oh, Crisis and reformation, but usually it's crisis and reformation of capital, right? They capital yeah. wins most of the crises, um, and so one of the big questions is why did working people win the one in the 1930s? Well, they didn't in the 1870s, they didn't in the 1890s, they didn't after World War One, they didn't in the 70s, uh, and they didn't in 2008. Mm. And we can talk about that. Yeah, well, why? <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> well, it goes back to the original question. Is this uh, my argument? Is basically um, well, the old argument used to be, and I think it might be helpful to lay out the old argument first, just because it it, it helps clarify things. The old argument was there was this building progressive tradition. It went from the the populist up to the progressive era and then up to the New Deal. And so you sort of see this linear growth of, of, of progress and protest and the rise of the left that finally achieves uh, something in uh, the 1930s under, under Roosevelt. I actually think if you want to turn that around a little bit, you can actually see you know, the populists get um, uh, destroyed. The progressive era makes a lot of really important reforms, but none of them are really around... Uh, large-scale unionization or redistribution of wealth. Um, and so the New Deal is actually different. It's an exceptional moment that stands out. So what I see is uh, like a series of uh, protests, collapse, protest, collapse, protest, collapse, rather than an upward trajectory. Mm. So what happens? So uh, a couple of things. One, I think that the intellectual heritage of those movements mattered, and the political heritage mattered, not as much as a lot of the old school historians do. But I think they do matter. I think 
the war mattered. Actually, if you go back, and this is, you know, Randolph Bourne, the great intellectual, said war is the health of the state. And, and um, if you go to um, World War One, that's when you actually see a massive spike in unionization that collapses right afterwards. So here, so the contingencies that go on in the 1930s are very interesting. First, FDR is elected many years into the crisis, right? It's not like Obama where... You know, mm. it, you're in midstream in this. You're deep in. Hoover, you had three years of Hoover policies. FDR gets a massive mandate uh, to, in office in '33. He makes tremendous leaps in the growth of the use of the state, and almost all of them are disaster. They're found either uh, unconstitutional or they don't work or whatever. And so is this the call, the first New Deal? Is this what you're yeah the first to? New Deal? Right. What what people call the first New Deal. Um, Nobody during the New Deal said first or second New Deal, but right. we, we we look back and say that. So mm-hmm. so by so then by thirty five, he's had you know three years of failed Hoover policies, a complete first attempt at a new New Deal uh, at a New Deal, and it doesn't work. Then he gets another chance in thirty five when that one collapses, and this time that's when we get the the, the main things that I'm interested in: social security, labor rights, and um, fair labor standards. And Jeff, can I, can I jump in real quick here? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. I'm curious about this this sort of second New Deal. Um, yeah. We've talked a little bit uh, on the show with uh, you know descendants of Huey Long, and so I'm, uh-huh. specifically, I'm curious what role did those sort of the popularity of those populist movements that Huey Long and to to a certain extent Father Coughlin represent? Right. What role did that play in pulling FDR to the left and and creating the space for this second New Deal? Yeah. No. I think that's very interesting because the the populist impulse in the United States is very very deep, right? And and it cuts left, right, center. You know, it's kind of it's it's an amorphous beast, American mm-hmm. populism. And what's interesting is you know, and 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 the Townsend plans, I think in particular, mm-hmm. another sort of populist appeal, uh, uh, really kind of held FDR's feet to the fire in a way. Even though the, some of these ideas, Father Coughlin's, were a little a little uh, loopy, especially later. In yeah, the he went off the 30s. rails. Yeah. But what's interesting is at this one moment, the the Democratic Party and uh, its leader, FDR, committed to uh, uh, sort of reformulating the economy, trumps the populace. He actually outflanks it. He uses their energies, mm-hmm. as you're suggesting, but he wins. Oftentimes... Uh, presidential figures and, and parties sort of lose that energy or get lost in that energy. And you can see it a little bit with the Republican Party right now. They're kind of, they lost their identity within the Tea Party thing, and they can't figure out how to govern now. Mm-hmm. Um, but FDR was able to kind of control and manage this in very, very sophisticated ways, and I think that helped make the Second New Deal what it was. But if you really want, I actually think it wasn't just the populist. I think the real story was the 1934 strike wave. Because what happened was, uh, in the first New Deal, labor is given the right to organize. It's sort of a right without any backing uh, under Section 7A of the National Industrial Recovery Act. And so so there's, everybody goes on strike in 1934, and then they find out, oh, my goodness, uh, we have a right with no protections. And then the troops are called out, and the strike's crushed. And, you know, the entire South goes, the whole textile um, south goes out on strike. There's massive strikes in the north. It's, it's going on all over the place. And so that one of the re- another sort of contingency is here. Then Robert Wagner is, is ready to go with a real labor bill in 1935 that creates the National Labor Relations Act and board. Um, but it's really kind of that first draft of the first New Deal, then a social upheaval. Okay, we really need to address this now. And then Wagner's there with 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 the um, with the bill. Um, so, uh, what was I going to say? We're we're pretty, we're pretty thick into some pretty technical history here. So, yeah, no, and it's, and it's fascinating. I think it's really important for, for people to understand. Oh, this is where I wanted to go. So, 
you know, you've got you've got people today like your Robert Reiches who are uh, sort of suggesting, well, we need to return to the New Deal, have a new New Deal, if you were. Right. Then you've got some someone like, say, Richard D. Wolf, who's a, who's a Marxist mm-hmm. economist, and he says, well, no, that would be insanity. We've tried that. We failed, and the way that we failed is we we failed to address the the structures within capitalism, the ownership structures within capitalism. We allowed shareholders to maintain uh, their dominance and failed to give workers control over what they're doing. And so he advocates, say, uh, what he calls democracy in the workplace, which is you know another way of saying socialism, essentially uh, in in the economy. I wonder where you fall. On that spectrum, obviously, I think you're you're arguing against a return to this New Deal idea. Do, do you do you fall more in line with say what a Richard D. Wolf is proposing? Well, well, so I mean, I would I would take a revised New Deal in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Um, and I uh, I just I, I have a hard and I, I would you know I would be a champion of that. I I was a champion of the Employee Free Choice Act. You know, I actually thought I I, I didn't always believe it was going to pass, but I you know I, I was behind it. Um, that, but that said, my argument is basically, I don't think that's the right place to be looking given the structure of politics today. And I think the same problem applies to the types of things that, you know, the, the idea that we return to some sort of industrial democracy, um, uh, what used to be called industrial democracy, we don't even have much industry. Uh, right, right. <laughs> but, um, but you know some sort of workers' democracy. I, I think the same problems are there. Uh, I, I think the same divisions, the same questions about individualism, the same questions about uh, ethnicity and immigration, the same questions about race, uh, uh, and and the same problems with the state uh, and labor relations. They're, they're they're all remain there. So I you know I can sit here all day and say you know we should do this and we should do that. That's not my question. And, and you know, Wolf's mm-hmm. really good at that. He's really good at, you know, the, the full analysis of what we should do. But my, what I'm doing is sort of putting, holding the mirror up to the American working class and saying, okay, what do we have to do to, 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 to move forward in an effective way? And it requires a tremendous amount of social and political work before we can even begin to think about what direction we're going to go. And, mm. and it's a very sobering thing for me. It's it's not something I like to talk about. This is a sad project. I don't. I, I would love. <laughs> one of my undergraduates once I gave this, a lecture on this. One of my undergraduates came up to me and said, "I'm going to devote my life to proving you wrong." And I was like, "Dad, you know, you go, brother. That's yeah. great." Uh, I was very excited about that. <laughs> um, so far, uh, hasn't happened.